So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask as I start to paint. Yeah, I have a question. Um, well, no more questions from you. All right, just bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, so you, you were talking about earlier about, like, time and, like, how you're the fastest and how, you know, you'd be happy if we got three to four characters a month, uh, yeah, man. you know, completed this month. Um, so I, that kind of brought up the question that I feel like a lot of people have that haven't worked in a studio or even in the industry. How much time do you realistically have? Like, say sure. an art director gives you a brief and he's like, hey, this is, this is what we want, blah, 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 blah. Um, go. So, Sometimes like, I, like I, what I, if, like, at yeah. the end of the day you only have, like, two, like, six thumbnails, you know? Like, how... Yeah, so it all depends, right? It really does. Some studios, they'll want it like right away, and others they like they'll be fine with waiting a little bit. Um, it's it's not there's not like a like there's not like a committee of people who decide these types of things. You know, they're like, all right, all concept art should be done, and within two to three days, this is the mandatory requirement from all concept artists in the world you know it's it's obviously that's not the case right so you have to understand that when i say that you guys will be fine i don't mean that you, when a company reaches you and they say we want seven thumbnails in a day um or they won't even say that they'll just say they just want something <laughs> okay and you just have to to educate them on what you will provide okay so let me give you an example uh, of different experiences that I've had, and just hopefully you'll understand that it isn't. There is no right answer to this, but it is a good question. Um, so, for instance, uh, when I worked at Sony, I was asked to do a shield design. Now uh, that's it. They're like, "This is the shield. This is what's going to be." Now, how I was going to present that shield was up to me, and that's when I, like, through my experience working at Sony and other studios, that's why I've discovered that clarity is key. I'll see you later. Um, oh, you're going to come back. I'm sorry. You got to go to the log dog out. Um, do, you, do you understand? Like, I, I just presented them. <laughs> I just presented them uh, whatever I felt was was appropriate. And that's over the years I learned that that's not smart to just send them just really rough sketches. Like, I, I've discovered. Okay. Because you just go in circles more and more, all right? But, uh, but you know, they gave me as much time as I needed almost. Like, they were like, yeah, you know, it's fine. Just take your time. And so I did, like, it took me, like, a month and a half to do the shield design to finally get to, like, final stages of the shield. Okay? And uh, I was asked one time for a commercial to do some illustrations for, like, a, for the, a car commercial, right? And I should have had fully rendered drawings by the end of the day, you know, and a lot of them. This is where I started learning 3D and photo bashing is very, very valuable to me, um, specifically for film too. the same thing. They were like, you know, we want some costume design by the end of the day, photorealistic, go, you know. So it all depends on who you work for. Right, and the kind of timeline that they they are given as well. And like I said, I've worked in circumstances even at the same company where I was given something and I was given all the time in the world to work on it, and then the next day they're like, "Oh, you have to tomorrow." Okay, and then I have other instances where it was very clear that we had to get a lot of work done, and so I had no delusion, so I would I'd focus my time a little bit more appropriately. Do you understand? Hello? Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want my birds talking to you. No, you can you can talk to me, just walk, <laughs> walkie-talkie style. That's all. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah that makes sense. I, I guess, you know, there's like this, like, I've never worked in the industry, you know, you kind of think, like, like, you don't know how fast you are. You know, like, we look at you and we're like, that's that, that that's fast like yes. and, and i understand that you're saying like oh this isn't like 
the industry standard like you take it to a high grade to make sure that you're fast yeah um, let me let me explain that too um i was once in school and my teacher said you know either you're either really really good or you're really really fast right he said, because if you're fast, then you can keep up with production schedules, right? But if you're good, you'll you'll bring quality to the project, right? And I was like, what if you're fast and good? I remember thinking that <laughs> in the class. And I even asked him that. I was like, is it possible? And he's like, he's like, no, not likely. There's not too many people that are really fast and also really good. And I was like, well, then I'm going to be that person. You know, that's what I thought. And to my surprise, there was plenty of people that were really fast and good. <laughs> so I, was, I wasn't going into uncharted territory. There was plenty of artists that were already doing it. David Levy is one of those examples. Sparth. You know, these guys are still amazingly epic. Yeah. But like I said, like these are exceptions. You know, you have to understand that. Okay. But I get, I get why it can be confusing because you're like, well, this guy's a professional. like, And no one ever really talks about how fast they are. And whenever you do see a fast artist, you're like, man, everyone must be fast. And there's some truth to that. Um, like Most artists that are really good are faster than you, what you would expect. But um, yeah, most people take you know a few hours to, to get something decent where I can, it takes me a few minutes. And I'm trying to say that I'm not better than them. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not. I'm trying to say that I'm just fast because I chose to. And I'm only fast at very specific things. Now, if you were to ask me to do a vehicle design, right, uh, I would have a hard time. I would actually take much longer. And it's for obvious reasons. I haven't trained myself to be a really good and epic vehicle designer. You know? And it's, it's really that simple. If for whatever reason I woke up and I said, yeah, it's like, you know, I want to be a really good vehicle design, then I'll, I'll do everything that I've taught you guys. I'll just start guiding myself to learn more and more about vehicles and the anatomy of a vehicle and start practicing it until it becomes second nature to me. And then when it becomes second nature, then it'll become very quick. I'm not a terrible vehicle designer. But I'm not an excellent one, and it takes me. It will take me time to do a vehicle. Would probably take me several hours to do a decent uh, series of vehicle designs. Where if I had to do robot characters, specifically kind of the ones I do for myself, yeah, minutes, man. But if I was asked to do a very realistic um, robot that would be engineered and can actually work, uh, that would take me months. You know. I can get like some really cool impressions of one, but it wouldn't necessarily be epic. I'll see you later. Um, if if nobody else has any questions, um, well, let's uh, let's double check. Does anyone else have any other questions? Just to make sure, because yeah, you're welcome to ask another question. Seems like I'm nobody. Oh, wait, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just looking like the way you're painting and stuff. Um, like I was a fan of your work since a really long time. Thank you. I actually, Appreciate it. <laughs> actually, what I noticed is like what you were talking about the shapes. Uh -huh. You have a very um the, the silhouette of your characters are really really good. So this is what um, impresses me the most in what you do. Actually, it's it's not like fashion, but it's like I don't know. It's somehow fashion slash. Hard to me. I don't know why. Yeah, no, like, it is. So, yeah, yeah. Like, that's why. Like the combination is like really, really nice. I, I really, really like it. Even when you build the robots, like there's some sense of, I don't know, like horror in them. Yeah, you're right. Oh, they're scary. No, <laughs> like, you're right. <laughs> yeah, because I spend a lot of time looking at pleasant things. <laughs> you know, when I, I watch like horror movies and stuff. Right? Yeah, I um. I I study a lot of product design. I look at a lot of car design, and I look at a lot of fashion design. And all these industries, their whole goal is to make things look dope, like look amazing. You know, there's no story. There's no kind of like, you know, what I mean, it's just it just looks cool. And they, their tools are shapes and forms. 
and color and pattern and texture. These are their tools, and I just learned a lot from looking at their stuff. And uh, that's all I've tried to make a point of earlier, you know. Is, and I've talked about it even in you guys's in the critiques, right? I mentioned to you guys, you guys should look at things that um, that are not what you're normally looking at, because if you just keep looking at concept art, you're only going to be inspired by concept art. And there's a place for that, and I highly encourage you to keep looking at amazing concept art or art in general, because it will help know, guide you to know what's out there, right? But if you only look at that, then you're only going to be guided by that, right? So you have to like bring something new to the table. And like you said, there's something about fashion in my, my designs. Well, it's because I love fashion design. Not in the sense that I'm like out there wearing like the, the next designer coats or something crazy. I actually can care less on my own appearance. It's it's just uh, the overall design of it. Like there's some beauty to there that I really appreciate. Although I'm not like a fashion designer in in any particular sense. Yeah. See you later, Tony. And so my point to to you guys is always just like acquire the kinds of aesthetics that you would like to see in your own artwork by just finding it and looking out into the world. Yeah. And I, uh, I think the, the, I'm not a, even a horror guy. I don't really like watching scary movies. Okay. And so it's not like that. I'm into horror. I think the reason why that happens and why I even get picked for horror movies is because I like painting forms. Forms are fun to paint and horror lends itself to painting abstract and really interesting forms, like really bizarre monsters, you know, mm -hmm. are like the, the fun, the most fun to paint. All right. And they look good and tangible because they're monsters. All right. And so that, that's probably why I have a, a lure to that. It's not because I'm like really into scaring the shit out of people. It's because I'm I'm just genuinely into the the sense of um, forms that come from that kind of painting. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because I thought when you draw something like you have a mass story, like there's something behind it before, like you plan it before you. Yes, yeah, I don't do any of that. I just start and then just end up being weird. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's because, like I said, it's a lot of what guides me is my um, uh, my internal reference that I've gathered over the many years, like the kinds of stuff that I've practiced. That my subconscious is full of just painting well and designing well. That's it. And it's, it just has a lot to do with just a lot of practice. I've been doing this for quite a while. And so, yeah, I mean, um, anyone can achieve it, too, is what I'm trying to get at. It just takes some effort. Uh, yeah, you had another question? No, I'm cool. Okay, great. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Maybe so? I think um, someone else had, you were going to say there, there was going to be another question you were going to ask earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah it's not really a question. It was, uh, I was wondering if you could like, I, I don't know why, but I think it would be insightful, like an example of when you failed, like when you shouldn't have. Does that make sense? Oh, like, man. There's so many examples. All and like, how is that beneficial to you? You know, so all kind the of time. Some of that. Yeah. Okay. So I'll give you, I'll give you a good one. Uh, I was working at a studio, and I got complacent. I just kind of did whatever I was told, and I just worked on whatever I was working on. <laughs> and then one day, the studio shut down, and then I was. <laughs> Excuse me. I was laid off. And when I was laid off, 
that was the same time that me and my girlfriend, now my wife, were planning on moving in together for the first time. Okay. And I was just like, uh oh. You know, because I don't have a job. And that job was going to help us pay for the rent or then the move in, you know? And now I don't have that money. And I was just like, uh oh. Like, this is bad. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't have a portfolio because all the stuff that I did for that company was just like odd jobs and things I didn't really care about that are just kind of garbage, you know, just like little, a bunch of one-offs. It wasn't anything glorious. And I was just like, oh no, like what am I going to do? You know what I mean? And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, like, well, how did I get myself in this predicament? And it had a lot to do with like just complacency. And a negative complacency. I actually don't think complacency is entirely bad. It all depends on your perspective on it. For instance, if you're happy with the life that you have and you have no further ambitions, that's actually fine. Because all that matters, I think, is your happiness. Right? Some people are happy by continuously pursuing things that they'll never get or pursuing things that they'll get and then they'll find something new new to pursue, and then they'll never feel a real accomplishment, fulfillment. I'll get more into that, I'm sure, in future classes. But the point is, is that I didn't have anything, and so I just sat there for like two hours thinking to myself, like, this sucks. And I was I genuinely frustrated and depressed about it for about two hours. And then after two hours, I was like, all right, well, what can I do to fix this problem? And I just said to myself, I just need to make a portfolio. You know? And so then I made a portfolio. Uh, luckily for me, my boss felt bad about the whole ordeal, so he, you know, tried to hook us up with some freelance, which was great. It allowed me to get enough money to move into my, my girlfriend, now wife. And, uh, and then I took that opportunity, too, to just work on my portfolio, and then I got approached by Sony after I did, like, a Smash Brothers fan art painting. You know, and then uh, I did an art test, and I got the job. And I worked at Tony, and then everything ever since then has been uh, it's been mostly successful. But that's just one moment in my whole career, okay, uh, where I failed, and I just learned from it. I learned that even though I was at Sony. I should always be pursuing my uh, excellence in my portfolio. That's why I still, to this day, do tons of personal work. Okay? Because personal work, to me, is a great way to keep updating your portfolio. And it's proven true. I've grown a large fan base because of it. I've, I um, was able to start teaching online courses because of it, you know? Um, I was able to, to get the kind of jobs I f actually want to do because of all this, you know, constant making of my own portfolio. And it's great. But there's many, many examples that I have dealt with throughout my whole career that I just keep failing at. And I'll keep failing. I have no doubt that there will be continuous failing. But um, the things that I will succeed in will be quantified by or yeah, they'll be quantified by the fact of all those failures. You understand? Because of that mistake of not pursuing my portfolio outside of my job, I was un I was not prepared once I lost that job. But that never happened ever again. I've I've always been able to have some control over my work and ability to get jobs when I needed it. Make sense? Yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one of my closest friends gave me some great advice one time when I was going through some real life issues. And he said, you know, life is, well, he said, art is easy, but life is hard. And that's so true. Hope that gives you some good insight. Yeah, man, I just wanted to ask, because, like, I, um, uh, I don't necessarily, I listen to art podcasts, of course, 
you know, cool. every now and then. But honestly, I like listening to entrepreneur podcasts a lot more. Um, cool. Because I think that there's a lot to learn from there to apply to the art field. And there's this guy named Gary V. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, I know Gary. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah, dude, he is like the man. And he always talks about failing and how, you know, learning from other people's failures and their failures. And that's the only way that you're ever going to be anything is by failing. Um, and I, I don't know. I just, I, I really resonated with that. So oh, yeah. I, don't know, I thought it was good. Yeah, think of it like this, you know, failing is how nature works, right? Like the animals that don't, you know, make the cut, get cut out, right? And that's just how it's been for many, many years. And the animals that are able to to survive stick around and able, the animals that don't, um, you know, go extinct. And that's just, a, that's just nature's way of dealing with failure right and if you think about one of nature's greatest or latest inventions at least in our solar system is the human mind okay yeah no problem lisa see you later <clears throat> you know the human mind is great because what the mind does is like this epic computer that allows us, the human mind specifically, human brain, is this epic computer that can adapt to trauma and to failure to adjust your cognitive behavior. Meaning that when something happens to you, especially if it's traumatic, then your brain has a really good way of saying, pay attention, let's fix this. You know? A lot of animals don't necessarily have this and never have it at this capacity like we do, like the conscious thought of being able to recognize what we did wrong and then find ways to, you know, correct it. The human brain is really good at that. And so... Um, We've built a society recently around the idea that, like I was mentioned earlier, that failure is a terrible thing, right? That there's such a thing as winners and losers, you know? And there's truth to that, right? Like if you were to run a race, right? Like if I were to run and you were to run and I beat you in the race, I'm better than you. There's no, there's no denying that, right? I'm faster than you in the running, okay? And, you know, if we play a video game and I beat you 10 to 1, or you beat me 10 to 1, right? You're better than me at that video game, you know? Um, and and if I um, paint really epic robots in a matter of minutes and you can't, then I'm better than you, right? There's no denial to this. But the problem is to think that the reason why I'm better than you has nothing to do with training. Like the reason why I beat you in the race is maybe because I ran more than you, right? I've done a lot of training in it. So there's no reason why you should have beat me. The reason why you were able to beat me in the video games is because you played hundreds more hours than I did. So there's no reason why I should have beat you in that game. You understand? And the reason why I'm a better painter than you, at least for now, is because I've maybe have more experience than you do, which is the, it's the fact. But well, the problem is that people hide that reality, that there's winners and losers, and if you lose, you suck, right? And I'm saying, yes, there's winners and losers, but the winners win because they've put a lot of time and effort into the things that they've done, and that's why they're the best. That's why they're good. And there's no reason why you can't do it either. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, like... Like honestly, like if you were if you and Gary were to make a podcast together, you'd be pretty much saying the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because he talks he, about my L is my L. I don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks about my L. Yeah. And it's like and, it's mine. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. And so he he's right a lot of times. I love that guy too. He has a lot of good insight as well. And I believe people that have that kind of insight have made a lot of failures in their life. So that's why they're a little bit more objective. You know, people that haven't 
like Donald Trump are not as objective. I am the best. What are you talking about? Everyone loves me. That's the, that is clear signs of insecurities, of realizing that maybe he isn't so dope. Maybe he isn't so great, right? And it's unfortunate for him that he had to deal with this by being the president of the United States. It's really unfortunate because uh, there's something called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is compounded by the bigger the lie. It's like saying uh, you believe in Santa Claus, right? And then one day someone says, questions that and says, there is no Santa Claus. Like, it's your parents. And you're like, no, that's not true. Because I mailed, I sent a, a mail to Santa Claus and he mailed me back. And like, there was cookies and he ate the cookies, you know? Like, I even saw him. Like, you can't tell me there's no Santa Claus. And then they're like, no, that's your parents. Your parents wrote the letter back. You, uh, you saw your dad. It must have been your dad or your mom dressed up as Santa Claus. And the cookies your parents or someone in your house ate those cookies to trick you. You know? And and someone in the position where they're like, no, like, like that's not true. You know, they'll the it's harder for them to convince themselves that they're not true or they're not they're they're wrong if they believe that for longer and they've explained it to more people. So the more you 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 tell people that there's a Santa Claus and the more you you try to prove it and the more and more and more you try to spend your whole lifetime making this case that there is a real Santa Claus, the more it's going to be, it's going to be harder for you to, um, it's going to be harder for you to reject that idea. You understand? And uh, for someone like me, and, and it seems like someone like Gary, he experienced failure and criticism in a way where it was scaled so that he can admit that he made a mistake like I was able to admit that I made a mistake and then take a step back and say, I need to think differently about all this. Make sense? Where someone like uh, Trump, or let's use another example, like Bush, President Bush, he believed with all of his heart. That you, was... can, you can keep using Trump. He sucks. <laughs> but look, I'm not saying that he's the only one. It's just, it, it's, there's many examples and world leaders uh, are great examples of this because uh, they're saying their lies to millions of people, you know? And it's harder to say, you know what? You know, this whole Muslim band, I was wrong about that. You know, if he was to say that, if, if Donald Trump was to say that his travel ban and his idea for building a wall was a terrible mistake, like if he just said that today, if he did a press conference, and that he didn't think about it through, he didn't realize the gravity of the, the issue, my idea of Donald Trump would completely flip because I'll be like, holy smokes, this is actually could be really good for our country. Well, yeah, you, know I mean? you can look into that and like because, it shows character. Yeah, it, because it, then he not, demonstrates not, that he, he, yeah, he demonstrates that he's a human, right? Yeah. And that's, that would be the only redeeming factor, you know, that he could possibly do to make this country turn around and say, maybe we should give him a chance. Otherwise, it's not. It's going to get worse and worse. And it's easy for people like you and I to just say that he's stupid, he's a moron. But the reality is um, he's perpetuating his own downfall by continually doing that. And what I'm trying to get at with getting back to art and you brought up Gary and myself, it's like uh, we, me and him recognize that failure is in, in inevitable. And the sooner you can recognize failure and admit defeat, the sooner you can start fixing it, right? And so, so for instance, let's use an example of uh, Overwatch. Have you played Overwatch before? No, I played games. <laughs> I played games. So you, you get it. It's a video <laughs> game. Yeah. It's a first-person shooter. You know what it's about. So, and you don't really need to know anything about it other than the story I'm about to tell you in relevance to what we're talking about. So think about it like, this, like, you know, I talked about failure is a, is a good staple of growth. So check it out. Jeff Kaplan, he is the, the game director of the game currently, okay? And when I worked at Blizzard, there was this kind of ghost town feel in one of the teams. And that team was specifically um, Team Titan, okay? And the reason why is because T, the, the Project Titan 
was this game that was being worked on for seven years. And Jeff Kaplan was the game director of that. And for seven years, they made a pretty shitty game. There was nothing about it that was any good. Okay? And for seven years, they were trying to find a game that was going to be epic. Okay? And it just didn't work out. And it was a complete failure. A complete and utter failure. And the great Chris Metzen was able to sit down with Jeff and the team and say, you guys have failed. This is not going anywhere. This is a failed project. We've put too much money too much time, it's time to stop and start over. Okay? They had to downsize the team. They had to remove countless amounts of the effort. They basically threw it away. People grew tremendously resentful to Jeff and the rest of the team. You know? And it destroyed Jeff Kaplan. Okay? Like, he was destroyed. Because, he like, not only was the project failed, but he was, had to fire people that he came close to. People hated him, right? But he failed. And from that failure, it will come up. He realized that all of what he was trying to do was a mistake. Not because of the team, not because of the, the idea of the game, it was all because of him. It all came down to him because he had his fingers in everything. And if uh, nothing could get approved unless he approved it first. Right? And that was very devastating to kind of a, a, a workflow like where you're trying to create a really unique experience. You need everybody's input. And he didn't care for that. Not in a, a malicious way. He just didn't see it. He didn't realize the problem with trying to art direct the art director when he's not an artist. Okay. Not to say that he ha can't have his opinions, but he should respect the opinions of those he hired that are experts at what they do. You understand? And you know how I know this? Because when I was at Blizzard, he said all this to all of us. Like we were in a theater because of Blizzard cinematics, we use the, the movie theater to, it's like epic. We use a movie theater to have our meetings, our big meetings once a month. It was great. And Jeff Kaplan came and apologized to the whole team. And he said all this stuff that I'm saying to you right now. And as I was listening to him say all this, I was like, dude, this guy's got his shit together. Like, he's, he's cracked the code of this thing called life, right? And he said, you know, this is a complete failure, and I take most of the blame, you know? He's like, it was a stupid mistake. And he said something like, because he was a game director on World of Warcraft when it first came out. And he admitted that he had some uh, arrogance to believe that he had this ability to, to make great games. But then one person gave him advice after all this stuff blew out. He's like, you know, you're not as good as your, your, your best game. You're as good as your last game. You know? So it doesn't matter if you do a really good job of uh, World of Warcraft if the next game you make is complete garbage. I mean, it does say a lot to you about you if you have that ability to make that great game in the first place, but, you know, maybe that's all you had in you. You're a one-hit wonder. You understand? And he he was told that, and I think it hit him hard, real hard. And he, he said all this in a meeting, and he said that we're working on another project, and we feel much better about this, and the way that we control this is more of a team effort. He said, I let go of more of my responsibilities. You know, we, we've had a great art director named Arnold, and I let Arnold basically have the final say in almost all art. Like, I will voice my opinion, but if Arnold says that I'm wrong, then he can veto me, and I can't veto him. You know? And he said all this in the meeting, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'm glad to hear that. I hope the project works out. Right? That's what I was thinking. The project, the baby that came out of that was done in about a year. And it was done with like a, a third of the team that they had before. And that game is Overwatch. You see what I'm saying? See what happened there? Yeah. Um, another great example, a little bit more popular, Steve Jobs lost Apple. Right? 
He lost yeah. the company that he started. And then he came back and made the company bigger than ever. The reason Apple's still fucking around even to this day, even though he's gone, is because of the legacy he brought to it. And if you if you watch any of his movies or read any of his biographies, he failed a lot, including potentially denouncing his daughter as his daughter as one of his biggest failures. Right? Like he he even told his daughter that he named Lisa not after her but after like the some acronym, right? And then later in his life, he admitted that it was named after her. That he knew that it was her, his daughter. He just was being stupid, you know? It's friggin' crazy. Uh, Pixar. Pixar is great. I love Pixar's story. Uh, Pixar started off as a tech company that just did renders and 3D stuff, you know? And uh, they basically were in debt for like $5 million. And they were a, a side project of of uh, Lucas films and stuff, right? Like uh, George Lucas owned it. And George Lucas and Steve Jobs are good friends. And uh, George Lucas sold Pixar to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs bought Pixar from him. And Steve Jobs believed that 3D animation is the future of animation although there was nothing but failure. John Lasseter, who was basically the key animator and now the key person of Disney and Pixar, but at the time, worked for Disney, got fired because he was dabbling in this new idea of 3D animation, and they didn't think it was anything there. He went and worked for Pixar, and he's like, this is great. And they're like, yeah, we don't have an animator. We would love to have an animator. So that's what he did. And he brought great animations to their projects for once. And you know, they did some special effects here and there for some movies, but you know, Steve Jobs believed that they can do more. They can do a full film that is completely 3D. He believed that it was the future. And he was able to have enough faith in them that they were five years into debt. They had $5 million in debt. Uh, they were struggling for five years doing odd jobs to finally have an opportunity to work with Disney to make Toy Story. Okay, I can make a fully full length 3D animated film. It originally was going to be a short film, then it became a full length film. And then they stuck with the parameters that they can control, like, you know, plastic materials and hard surfaces. That's something that they can do a really good job of. So they stuck around that. That's why Toy Story was the first one they did. And their first draft of Toy Story, they sent to Disney. Disney looked at that first draft, okay? And they're like, this is garbage. You guys have been working on this garbage for the last year. Like, we're going to pull the plug on the project. And they're like, but this garbage is like what you guys wanted. Because Disney wanted very specific parameters. They didn't want anything to compete with their own animated films. And so, so you know, they wanted a more, like, mature animation field. They were going to use 3D as that tool. John Lasseter didn't believe in that. He just did it because that's what they were telling him. And then he's like, you know what? What do we have to lose? They're going to fire us anyways. So why don't we spend, like, give us another few weeks. We'll give you a, another draft. And so for the next few weeks, they freaking grinded and grinded and grinded and grinded, you know? And then they pumped out the second draft of Toy Story. They sent it to Disney, and Disney's like, okay, this is a little bit better. All right, we'll give you one more year, all right, to make this film happen. And there was even, like, there's a documentary about it, and there's one of the producers at Disney, I believe it was, uh, and he himself doubted the project the whole time, right? And then when they showed the first screening, you know, because they always show a screening before they release it to the public, you know, months after, right? They, months before they, they screen and then they show, reveal it to the public. So they had the first screening, and when he watched it in, like, you know, their screening room, that producer said, that was the first time that I realized that this is not a gimmick, that this is actually pretty amazing, you know? And he had no, he had doubts and he had concerns, but he's like, that was the first time I realized that this is actually going to be a big. And once he realized that, he said, we have to put all hands on deck on marketing, push the shit through. And then Toy Story came out and it became not only the first full length animated film, Right? That was all 3D. But it was an amazing fucking film. 
It was like one of the greatest movies ever made. And it has a lot to do with the failure of Steve Jobs and John Lasseter. You know? These guys had failed already. They had a better sense of what failure looks like. And their their understanding and scope of success broadened because of that. And so when Disney started falling apart, when they tried to make their own 3D films and they weren't any good, guess who they called? John Lasseter. Because he has the experience and know-how of what failure looks like and how to get past it. And the reason why Pixar was starting to fall apart a little bit is because a lot of these people are kind of spoiled. They've always just been knocking out hits after hit. And when John Lasseter starts to, to move himself away from um, the film industry, or from, uh, specifically uh, Pixar, and they started have to do it on their own, guess what? They start failing again, right? But but this time, now the people that are failing have an advantage that they can fail with the hopes that they, you know, they, they have some guidance now from someone who can help them. But now they have more people in their, in their ranks that have failed at a larger length. For instance, uh, Andrew Stanton failed with the John Carter of Mars, you know? So now he's wiser. Uh, I have a friend who works at Pixar, and he used to tell me these great stories of like how all they would have Brad Bird, the guy who did Iron Giant and The Incredibles. Uh, they would have Andrew Staten, who did Finding Nemo, Wally, and then they had Pete uh, Proctor, I think that's his name, uh, who did um, some of the other ones like uh, Monsters Inc. Right, John Lasseter, who's pretty much the one of the founders of Pixar. Right, one of the key directors there. And Steve Jobs. And he and my friend Louie was in these meetings with like all these fucking titans, you know? And he said what he learned about that was that they would not just agree. They would argue in these meetings. They would be they wouldn't be like, Oh, I agree with you guys. Everything's great. Everything's perfect. No, it was like they would show up. And Steve Jobs will look at a clip that they had, and Steve Jobs will look at the, the animators and be like, this doesn't make any sense. You guys need to do this again. You guys need to make it more, more sense. And then they'd be like, what do you mean it makes no sense? Like, of course it makes sense. Like, look at this and that. And, like, and it's like, it makes no absolute sense. Like, none of this makes any sense. You guys missed the mark by a mile. And they're like, what? Well, how dare you? You know, you don't know anything about animation. And he's like, I don't need to know anything about animation. And, it, and in fact, the people who are going to watch this movie know nothing about animation. So you guys need to stop like living your guys arsy fartsy, you know. And these are the kinds of arguments that they would have, and they would just fucking fight, you know, and like literally scream at each other. He said they were like, like he would be in the room and it'd be awkward as fuck, right? <laughs> and he said when Steve Jobs passed, that went away, and that's when Pixar started to fall off the wayside a little bit because they didn't have someone question them and and prove to them that they made a mistake or they failed. And Steve Jobs was the kind of guy to do that because he proved himself in terms of success. And he's also proved himself how to deal with failure. You know? And so whenever I mention to you guys that failure is a great tool, I really mean it. Because it teaches you that you may have made a mistake and it's now how you handle that failure is how you can improve beyond it. And someone like Gary Vee is a great, a, a great leader of this too because he, he talks about that kind of stuff all the time. And not just because he believes in it, he's just some sort of philosophy that he has. No, it's because he's experienced it himself. Right? And that's why, uh, going back to like Donald Trump, the reason why he's a terrible leader and why he's incompetent is not because he's stupid. And it's not because he's like this moronic uh, uh, billionaire or whatever, millionaire, whatever the fuck he says he is. It's because he is not able to admit that he may have made a mistake. Not to the public, which is fine, but not even to his own administration. And that is extremely dangerous. See, I, I, might, I might play devil's advocate on that because I don't even know if he is capable of understanding that he is... Like because like his whole life. Oh yeah, I agree. That's what I say. That's, I agree. I think that's the problem. And he's old now. And he's senile. Yeah. It's like we got an old senile man running this country. Like he's, he's got... never had anybody put checks and balances on him. So now when yes. he's like 
criticizing the media. The media has been the first people probably in his life to ever really criticize him. Yeah. Oh, not just that, people, American people. But that's my point. Like, that's a great demonstration of not accepting failure. Okay? My point is, is that's what not accepting failure looks like. Okay? Not accepting defeat. That's what that looks like. Uh, I had some experience and some really bad failures where it, it, gauged, it changed my perspective on my goals in life. So, you know, something about Gary Vee I love is like his, his practicality to his advice, right? But what I don't like about Gary Vee is he also is preaching a lot of what all these other self-help people do, which is this idea of success that can only be achieved by um, constant ambition. I don't think that's entirely accurate. And in fact, he said one one time he had a really great phrase that I really did agree with, and I think he he is starting to realize this as well, and he's starting to change his tune a little bit. Um, which is, he said once, you know, if you're a guy who is like makes fifty thousand dollars and you you have a normal job and you live with your family and you're happy with your family and your lifestyle and you you live a, a normal and satisfying life with the people around you and you you go on the weekends on you know, small trips and every once in a while, every year you go on a bigger vacation and travel the world or you, do, you know, or maybe not, you just do whatever, but you're just happy. You know, if you're like someone like this, that is completely complacent and happy with all you have to do in your life, then you're my hero. That's what he said. Right. And what he was alluding to is this idea that I think he's starting to realize is that people gauge success by making more money or having a better career. Um, he's starting to switch his tone of success it can just be something as small as just being happy with your life, right? And I, that is something that I've acquired because over the many years I've been working and doing this hustle, it's never ending, man, right? And there's always this idea of I'll be happy once I get this or I'll be happy once I start doing that. Or once I get here, then things will be fine. Or once this happens, then things will be good. My happiness was always tomorrow, if that makes sense. And guess what? I I did get these things. I was like, you know, I'll be happy if I just get a job. I got a job. But then I got fired, right? And I was like, well, I'll be happy if I could get like a job at a really cool studio. I got a job at a cool studio. I worked at uh, Sony. You know? But then my daughter was born. And I was like, well, I need to be closer to home. So I'll be happy if I can just get a job closer to home. So I got a job closer to home. But it was at a small studio that reminiscent of the studio that I worked for before. And I was like, this is dangerous. I'll be happy if I can just make enough money to keep my family afloat. And I, I made money to keep my family. I started working on movies, right? And I was making the most money I've ever did on like a concept job was through film. I was making $4,500 a week. But I wasn't happy. I was just like, well, I'll be happy if I can just work from home or work closer to home and work for a big studio. Then I work for Blizzard, right? Like my dream job, because I love Blizzard. Blizzard is my favorite company in the industry. One of my favorite game companies ever. And I worked for them. And that's when I started clicking. It's like, well, when will this, when will I be fucking happy? <laughs> you know? And then I realized that I can be happy today. There's no reason. There's no reason to be chasing this thing. And I said, you know what? You know what makes me happy? Hanging out with my friends and family, and helping others achieve their goals. So I'll start doing tutorials. I'll start doing Gumroads, and that's why I started doing Gumroad videos. And then I was like, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start doing. Uh, I'm gonna start teaching how to to. Uh, be on a larger scale, I'm going to be like more of a mentor, a personal teacher. And then I started loving that. And I said, you know what? Like the, the most fun I've ever had in my whole career was trying to have a career. Like when I first was just learning so many things, you know? And I said, I'm going to try to make it so that um, that is what I'm doing full time. I'm just learning new things. And at the same time, I'm teaching people how to get better at their craft and try to work less. I think I could do that. And if I don't, it's fine. Because if I don't, it's, it's not a big deal. And if I do, it's no big deal. 
Um, because what I'll just start doing right now, I'll start teaching people anyway, and I'll start helping people anyway, and I'll start finding time for my friends and family anyway. I'm not going to wait around anymore. And I think some people like Gary Vee re realize this type of stuff. Celebrities fall into this. You know, I had a student uh, a few months ago. She was like distraught over the, the separation between uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. And she's like, oh, man, they're like a staple of what I thought a good relationship was. And I was like, listen, like just because they're celebrities doesn't mean they don't have real problems. I mean, uh, look at someone like, um, look at someone like Robin Williams. He overdosed on antidepressants. Why was he on antidepressants? Yeah, he may have made a bad movie here and there, right? But there's plenty of actors and actresses who make bad movies that don't feel depressed. And it wasn't like he made terrible movies that we were unforgiving of him, kind of like with going on with Nicolas Cage, right? We're just like, all right, Nicolas, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know? Like, we got it. Like, he had a, he's got to make that family road trip movie. We got it. You got to make, you got to pay the bills. It's fine. <laughs> you know? But he, he was depressed and he, he, he accidentally killed himself because of it. Why did Dave Chappelle cancel his contract with, um, to make the Dave Chappelle show? Because he just couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't keep the pressure. There's a great uh, interview he had where he was talking about, well, everyone just started, like, he, he, before he was like a C-list actor, right? He was a character actor. He's the kind of actor that you know who he is if you saw him, but you didn't know his name. You know, plenty of actors are like that, right? Like, if you saw this actor, oh, yeah, I know that guy, but you don't know the actor's name. That's the kind of actor he was. And when he had the Dave Chappelle show, he went from that to A-list actor, and everybody knew who he was. And he did, had a great comedy special that was amazing. And again, now he's, like, on the top of the charts, right? And he said all that attention and all that was frustrating because before he could go walk on the street and nobody would bother him, but now everybody would bother him and every second – and he would treat him like a clown, like everything that he had to say was a joke. And as soon as he said that during the interview, people started laughing, right? And then he looked at the audience and was like, see, you know? Like he wasn't trying to tell a joke. He was trying to say some real shit. And people were, because he's just was a funny guy and he has a funny way of saying things, people think that everything he's going to say is a joke. And it was kind of like a surreal moment to see it happen. You know, you're like, oh my fuck. He like proved his point like almost immediately. You know, um, there's a reason why the guy uh, who made and sold Minecraft. I'll see you later, who Yeah, see you next class. There's a reason why um, the guy from Minecraft, you know, was on his toilet tweeting, you know, I am in a million dollar party, right? Like I'm in a, I'm in a house in my house that cost me seventy million dollars, at a party full of A-list celebrities. But I've never felt most alone in my life. And what I'm trying to get at, and the the bigger insight I'm trying to give all of you guys, is that you guys will achieve your success. I don't have any doubts there. A lot of you will, but what I am want you to be cautious of is that when you get there. You know, don't be disappointed that you're not 100% happy. And when that does happen, and it, it will, and most likely will, you then ask yourself, then what can I do now to just to make myself happier about the kinds of things I'm doing? And I don't mean, like, work towards that happiness. Like, what can you do now? And for me, I've reached that kind of beautiful nirvana. Uh, I mean, I still get frustrated. And I get, still get stressed out. But overall, I'm very, very happy with my life and the other things, you know? And so, uh, you know, aside from just becoming a good character artist and being really fast, guys, at painting, you know, you should really also focus in on... Wait, hold on. You should also focus in on the quality of life aspect of it, too. That's something that you should be all practicing as well as trying to get better at this art business. And hopefully that gives you guys some good insight. And gives yeah, you man, thank you. To work towards a side of just being a good concept artist. Yeah, because, you know, 
uh, I said, like I said earlier, like the friend advice that I got, you know, art is easy, life is hard. So try to start making life easier. And, you know, like I had a tumor in my brain. I'm not sure if you guys knew that, but I got it removed. And during that time, yeah, I had really good perspective on life in general, right? I realized there's a lot of things to, to be very grateful for. And it, it changed everything about the perspective of I had on life in general. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. I already went over my time. But you guys have some great questions, so I wanted to answer them with great answers. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Don't worry, this won't be the last time we talk about like how to improve quality of life. Um, but also, you know, when you guys are working, hang out with each other. You know, one thing that's really great about this art stuff is community. Like, I've made some of my f favorite people. Uh, like, I've made friends with my, some of my favorite people in this industry through. I think that's the most important part, honestly. Yeah, I agree. Community, it's, like it's you can't take it for granted. Absolutely. So that's why I have like built the Discord around this idea of like building community. Um, you know, some of my good friends recommended it, and I'm happy they did because it's powerful. A lot of people hang out there and talk to each other and give each other feedback and advice, and it's really great. So I recommend you guys keep doing what you're doing, but also hang out with others and try to see if you can, you know, progress that way as well. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. Some people already had to bounce out because of time. All right, you have a good day. But you guys have a great weekend. Uh, work, you know, smart. Don't overwork yourself, but, you know, at the same time, try to really push your work as best you can. And I'll talk to you guys very soon. Laters. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.